back out on the streets. Protesters in Lebanon target government and financial buildings. They're angry at the failure of their leaders to deal with unprecedented hardships. As the country slips further into crisis, what can be done? And what will the fallout both at home and for the region be? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. Struggling to make ends meet and begging for food. Lebanese people have defied restrictions to contain COVID-19 and resume their protests. Rallies started in October but were interrupted by the lockdown. Violence escalated on Tuesday. Banks were set on fire and security forces pelted with stones. One demonstrator was killed and dozens were wounded in riots. Protesters are angry at the political elite that's been in power for so long and accuse their leaders of corruption and mismanagement. Lebanon is suffering its worst economic crisis in decades. Food prices are soaring and the Lebanese pound is in free fall. The country's appeal for assistance from the International Monetary Fund. Santa Hoda reports in the capital, Beirut. The state is close to bankruptcy. This country spends more than it earns. There's a huge debt, and for the first time in Lebanon's history, it defaulted on the debt. Now, that there was a leaked document which really caused an outcry because the government was reportedly thinking of touching people's deposits in the banks. And, of course, there are informal capital controls now. You cannot access your, your savings in the banks. That they were going to touch these deposits to fund the state. There was an outcry. Even politicians. Uh, uh, raised uh, the concerns because the prime minister said 2% of the deposits will be, uh, will be touched. And those 2% are the bank accounts of politicians and, and their cronies, uh, accounts in the millions and billions of dollars. So this doesn't seem to be an option. A few weeks ago, the prime minister and the president, they invited the International Support Group for Lebanon ambassadors from Western nations, Arab nations, and they appealed for financial assistance. They told them, please unlock the funds, billions of dollars in aid that you promised us in the past. And the answer really has been, we are not unblocking aid and we're not bailing Lebanon out unless there are structural and economic reforms. Politicians are reluctant to do that because if you do that, they lose control of, um, of the state's resources, which they've been accused of using for political gain. So the only option seems to be going to the International Monetary Fund. And again, politicians are reluctant to do that for two reasons. First of all, the austerity measures will hurt the poor and the austerity measures will hurt the politicians. Let's have a look at how bad the economic situation is. Lebanese people have been struggling to get their own money from banks after capital controls were imposed last year. They fear their savings will be wiped out as the Lebanese pound has lost three times its value on the black market. Banks have stopped giving short-term loans to businesses and no longer provide them with dollars for imports. Inflation has increased by 50 percent since the start of the year, and 45 percent of the population lives below the poverty line. AMF projects Lebanon's economic slowdown will be the region's worst this year. Its gross domestic product is expected to fall 12 percent. A new government was formed in January. It has criticized the governor of the central bank for his handling of the crisis. Riyad Salame has defended his organization's policies, and he's supported by the opposition. Many Lebanese are calling on the government to resign. The dollar is now worth 4,200 Lebanese pounds. Everything's become more expensive. Food has grown more expensive. All of the prices have risen. We can't even buy food or bread. We can't afford anything. We're daily workers. If we work, we eat. If we don't work, we don't eat. May God change the situation for the better. The economic collapse of the Lebanese pound will normally lead to this. People have lost their purchasing power, and the state has no plan to do anything. Banks are closed, not giving money. I think the government should resign and leave. Let's get the thoughts now of our guests. They are all in Beirut. Patrick Mardini, he's the president of the Lebanese Institute for Market Studies. Ibrahim Madimna is a civil society activist. And Jamil Mouad, he's a lecturer in politics at the American University of Beirut. Thank you all for joining me for this conversation. Before we talk policy, let's just talk about what it feels like right now in Lebanon. And you all are in Beirut. So I'm going to start with you, Patrick. What does it feel like right now? So people lost their jobs because of the bad economic situation. Companies have been closing down. 
They also lost their income and the purchasing power of their money. Those who had some savings at the bank, either those savings were in Lebanese pound and now they can buy them much less because of the sharp devaluation of the pound, or it was in dollar and now they cannot withdraw it in dollar. They are forced to withdraw them in Lebanese pounds uh, at a devalued, I mean, at a rate that is not the real actual market rate, making them lose further money on them. So people simultaneously lost their income, their jobs, the purchasing power of their income and their savings. They are mad. They think that they were robbed. They placed their money at the bank. The bank lended the money to the government. The government wasted it. And now we are telling them you won't be paid back. So that's the general sentiment here. Yeah, how, your thoughts on how we'll talk policy, but just how would you characterize how people feel? Matt Patrick says they're just mad. Yes, absolutely, they are. And uh, what's even worse, I think, and adds to the problem, is that they have lost all the trust in the all the all the establishment, all the state uh, institutions, and all the political establishment. And this, I think, uh, puts matter into a, a worse kind of direction, where they don't see any hope of change because they believe that the political parties have been uh, uh, who has been robbing the country of the, its resources. Uh, are still in power and there is uh, no serious initiative in the direction of making serious reforms or any kind of uh, intervention that can really shed some light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, we, the, 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 the Lebanese people find this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, clinging to power from the political establishment uh, really the, the, the major problem here and that they're using all the tools they can to remain in power and thus they are depriving the Lebanese, the Lebanese people from uh, a way to salvage the country from its uh, imminent collapse. D Jamil, what about that? So Patrick says um, that they're angry. Um, Ibrahim says there's also mistrust. How would you describe the feeling in Beirut right now? Uh, actually, I wouldn't say that everyone is angry uh, for, for different reasons. Uh, there is definitely a general atmosphere of uncertainty in Lebanon. The Lebanese society uh, at this specific moment is in limbo. So no one knows exactly where we're heading to. Of course, some people are angry, but this anger is not really manifested yet on the street. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, a lot of people might lose hope or they have already lost uh, hope. Some people are already questioning uh, the so-called revolution, what this revolution has achieved. Uh, so um, this general atmosphere, of course, uh, there is there, there's no one in control. There is a sinking boat and no one seems to be uh, in control. And this lack of leadership is the way uh, 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 that the regime is adopting in order to, uh, 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 to govern. Um, there are now multiple narratives on why we have a crisis in Lebanon, and these narratives are not one. They're not consolidated in one narrative, in one story. To each his own narrative. The central bank has his own narrative. The government has his own narrative. Okay, the commercial so... banks, they have their own narratives. So this situation of uncertainty uh, 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 is, you know, very heavy on the Lebanese society. The, the struggle is being individualized. We saw that in one moment in October, there was kind of a collective action. Mm -hmm. And now this struggle is being individualized because every individual, every fa family is fighting for its own survival. Okay, so let's talk about this. You talked about that basically everyone has, there's a different narrative. Let's talk about the government narrative. And I'm going to come back to you um, on that, Patrick. So people wanted a new government. They kind of shuffle the deck. There's, there's other people. But is there really a new government as you see it, Patrick? So uh, the new government adopted most of the plans of the past governments, which actually were inspired from the IMF recommendations. Uh, I see the policies continuing in the, in, the, in the same direction as before. Government spends a lot of money on uh, government monopolies, specifically electricity. Electricity is responsible of roughly 50% of the huge debt that Lebanon has. Why it's is like that, 170 Patrick? 50%. Why is well, that? Because, because electricity is subsidized in Lebanon. And even today, despite the very low oil prices, 
the the uh, the subsidy remains and the electricity company continue to lose money and the, the ministry of energy and finance never had the courage to switch for to switch from an from a fixed price to an indexed price where it might go up with the oil prices and go down with the oil prices so that's a big chunk of it the other chunk is that a huge investment have been made in the electricity sector. We import electricity through power barges from Turkey. It cost us a lot of money. We've also tried to uh, build some electricity factories. And those, all those massive projects cost billions of dollars. And the final result is uh, simply we, we still don't have electricity. We only have 12 hours of electricity per day. And all the past investment have been a huge failure, leading to half of the current debt without actually electricity. And this is all due to the government monopoly, the government mismanagement of the sector. The government does not let anybody come in, produce electricity more efficiently. They want to do it themselves and they can do it. They lose a lot okay, of money Patrick, on, on the sector. Patrick, hold on. I could tell that Jamil had a, um, wanted to say something to, to what you're saying about the electricity and the situation there. Jamil? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, uh, uh, going back to your question, uh, yes, we have a new government. It doesn't mean that the government is doing the right thing or uh, approaching politics differently or infrastructural problems and structural problems differently. Uh, to be fair, we cannot judge yet the government uh, because in, in, in 100 days or in three months, it cannot really solve the electricity problems. These are more structural uh, 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 problems unless we want to sell the you know electricity sector and say and we privatize it. Uh, the, the prime minister has a new discourse, let's admit it, yes, he has a new discourse whereby he's reviving the idea of the state uh, in his speeches, which is something we haven't seen uh, uh, necessarily before. The problem is, is that there is discrepancy between what he's preaching as a prime minister and the practice. Till now, the prime minister and the government, they did not take only one decision that appeases, you know, the economic situation. They're completely, you know, uh, 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 on the margin. You feel that they, they have no control over the inflation. They have no control over the banking sector. They have no control over whatsoever, you know, sector when it comes so to what the immediate... So what responsibility does he have? The responsibility that he, do he does have is to come up with a discourse, not only a te technical approach to the financial collapse. The government should tell us, should tell the Lebanese who is responsible for this economic and financial collapse. They should tell us when it comes to the political economy and not only the financial aspect of the crisis, who is responsible for okay. uh, uh, the economic situation. Till now, we haven't seen this discourse. So, Ibrahim, I'd be I'd be curious on your your thoughts on this. I mean, what there there is a, a new prime minister, there is new leadership, but I mean, how how hopeful are you hopeful um, about what he can do? Well, to be honest, I, I don't think the issue is here is mainly economic uh, policy I, or whether the electricity or any of those. Of course, this is the result of the kind of uh, policies that have been uh, conducted by the current establishment, by the political establishment, the same establishment that brought this government into power. And I believe that uh, this is not really a new government. It might be in terms of, uh, of the, uh, the persons in charge, or but I think it's still uh, tied into, uh, to uh, the political establishment and the political parties who voted for, uh, for confidence for this government in the first place. And uh, uh, like your guests were saying, there has not been a single initiative uh, from this government, serious one, to really deal with the problems. We have been hearing a lot of talk and a lot of promises and working on plans, etc., but nothing, nothing serious on the ground. Uh, I think that I'm not having very much uh, high hopes because uh, the interests of the political establishment into, into this government are very much constraining its... Uh, its maneuverability, they are not able really to uh, to resolve or to come out with, to the Lebanese people with uh, with transparency. Talk to them about the situation Ibrahim, and bringing back some any any of the com any confidence into them. So Sorry? in Ibrahim, and and as a result, the, the protesters are not going anywhere. I mean, they took a break because of a pandemic because they had to, and now they're right back out there. They are not going anywhere. At some point, will it not have to be more than just shuffling? 
the deck and who can actually make that happen? I mean, we all know that there's always been outside forces that have played a role in the in the internal dealings of Lebanon. Where are those people now? Well, well, basically, I think the people uh, after the coronavirus uh, pandemic, they have been uh, because of the lockdown, they have been all at home building really this uh, anger because of this uncertainty and the the, the kind of, uh, how do I say this, the government is totally crippled, you know, and people are trying to give it a chance, but it seems that they're not going to get anywhere. And I think the protests that have come uh, really uh, yani, gradually coming into the streets and really building up now are the result of people uh, having no, no light at the end of the tunnel. Slowly, we see what's happening in Tripoli and Beirut and, and, and Saida and other parts of the country. People are just going down to the street because they believe that this government, all the whole of the establishment, I think, uh, does not really have any solutions to the problem whatsoever. They are still okay. like throwing forth, back and forth the responsibility on each other. And today we saw a press conference for the governor of the central bank uh -huh. replying to the press conference conducted earlier by the prime minister accusing each other of, and you know, this this game really doesn't really solve the problem. And people are sick and tired of this kind of talk. They want to really have serious interventions, okay, serious so measures let me, let me, uh, coming out. Let me pivot yeah. to Patrick for a second though. Patrick, where, um, where is the aid? Where is the bailout? When Lebanon has been in precarious situations before, there's always been somebody there to, to kind of step in and help, be it Saudi Arabia, um, Iran has a hand in this. Where, where is the aid? Why is no one doing this right now? Uh, I think that uh, the international community and uh, even our neighborhood, uh, the, the countries in the region, lost confidence in the honesty and integrity of the Lebanese economic system. They feel that they wasted a lot of money on this country and this money have been spent on, on bad projects with no real, uh, no real uh, 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 added value to the population, right? So uh, everybody is saying, guys, you need to reform first. We need to be sure that the money that we give you, either through the IMF or through the CEDAR, you know, the, the international donor community, will be spent in a good way and, and won't be wasted like before. And that's why the current government has designed a plan. They published it and they made it available for everybody. Now, the problem with this specific plan is that uh, it aims at increasing taxes. They think that they can reduce government deficit by increasing taxes. Now, increasing taxes in a recessionary period is a catastrophe. It's a suicide. You cannot expect higher income from taxation if you increase taxes during a recession, right? Uh, and especially that if you plan to pay or, or to waste the money of the taxes you might raise on electricity, water, telecom, right? So if we remain in the past system where we want to waste the money, whether, we, that, whether the, the money that we get from taxes or the money that we get from donation on the same failed project as before, well, nobody so would let me, be let me ask you something, Patrick. When, when you say failed projects, um, let's just be honest. Are you saying failed projects because of poor decision-making or because of corrupted decision-making? Uh, if you look at Lebanon's ranking uh, uh, in the uh, at the word uh, 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 on the doing business, not, not the doing business index, uh, what do you call it? Oh, I forget the name. Anyway, Lebanon ranks very poorly on government decision making, on uh, on bribes, on uh, uh, on cronyism in in uh, in granting public contracts, and all those decisions are channeled through government-owned monopolies like electricity, water, and telecom. Right? That's where the Lebanese government wastes the money, and that's why I say we need to start dismantling those monopoly. I mean, the government plans for the next years, despite the huge debt and the current debt crisis, to spend 5.4 billion dollars on electricity and. And $4.8 billion on water, and we don't have this money, they plan to borrow it and spend it on the same project. While if you open the electricity sector to competition, for instance, instead for the government to build five new factories 
Private companies can come in, build those factories, sell electricity to people. They will have a more reliable uh, electricity supply, and they will save the government those $5.4 billion okay. uh, investment that are planned. Right. So the government needs to start thinking from this perspective instead of repeating the same it, old Okay, hold game, on. I'm getting, right? I'm getting, hold on. I'm getting a, a head shake there from Ibrahim. Ibrahim? Yes, uh, to be honest, I don't think that the issue here is about privatizing the public sector at this issue or not a, a, not even a, a monopoly issue, maybe a, at a later stage. Because even if we sell those assets or dismantle, like Patrick was saying, those monopolies, eventually they will end up back to the to the political elite who have been really uh, 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 accumulating their wealth with their with their nepotism and clientelism, uh, clientelism uh, networks and with uh, all their accessories. And eventually these these uh, public uh, assets will end up back into their hands, you know, because we don't believe that the government or any of this uh, political establishment will have a transparent process into privatizing those uh, assets. Nevertheless, we cannot sell these assets at the very uh, at their worst time when they're the, when they're worth uh, much less than re they are really worth. What we believe in is that the, there should be a kind of serious political reform and really a new blood into this uh, into the administration uh, Where will who can that come really from? bring back confidence in term, internally or externally from neighbors like you mentioned and then we can see how we can ha deal with the issue of the monopoly but uh, i think the problem is the uh, political in the first place and i uh, and uh, this kind of political establishment has proved time after time that they are not able really to, to deliver to the Lebanese people in a transparent way okay. uh, the kind of intervention they're expecting. So, Jamil, it, it seems pretty clear that the protest, while, while sometimes it, you know, obviously it takes time for change to, to effectuate change, particularly structural change, protesters don't have time. There are people that literally cannot feed their families. Where is this going? Yes, actually, protesters, they don't have time, but unfortunately, uh, they don't have a political project. They don't have a vision for this society uh, either. And this is the real problem. We're stuck in this uh, in this vicious circle where we have but riots. But hold on, but hold on, hold on, just a minute. Just a minute. Does, does the, hold on, hold on, Jamil. Does the protester who goes outside because he he can't get his money, he can't, all of his money is, is tanking, it, it, is it up to him to have a vision for how the society should go? That's not up to him. No, no, of course not, Nadine, no, of course not. I'm not judging these people at all. I'm saying that these people are left without alternative. That's why they're rioting in this way, and I completely support them. I'm not judging them at all. Actually, this is not violence. What, they, what they're doing is direct action, actually, against the power that is oppressing them. There's no way. But I'm saying there is no real alternative project. There is a disconnect between uh, uh, the values of the social uh, uh, movement and the practice. Still now, there is discrepancy between uh, activists, between social groups, and the real people who are on the street. So this is something very important. I mean, till now, if you go on the street and you say, do we privatize or do we not? I'm sure you'll get 100 questions. Now, uh, judging from the uh, debate between your two guests, there is, of course, there, there is, there is, you know, diff two different perspectives. One is advocating for privatization, and another one is saying, no, we should not uh, privatize. I mean, these issues are not debated now in Lebanon. Of course, we want to topple down the regime. Of course, we want to get rid of uh, the politicians, of the ruling class, that's for sure. But what is the alternative? Problem is, in this discourse, for instance, we absolve the uh, uh, external, you know, uh, 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 European or Western uh, countries from their, uh, from their responsibilities. We say, for instance, that uh, Sadr or other countries who are ready to bail out Lebanon, they don't have trust in the ruling class. Really, what about them supporting this real class for three or four decades? It's not about reform. We're stuck in a very complex situation whereby external uh, forces are really complicit with the ruling class in Lebanon. The only people who are really paying the price is the Lebanese citizen and those who are on the margin of uh, uh, power. I feel that we need a discourse really that uh, makes things more complex, more, and not only simplistic between the good and the bad, uh, between the powerful and the powerless. There is more, much more uh, 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 to the debate. One way of doing it is to believe in the public sector. Uh, in, the, in the struggle and the fight against corona, the public sector in Lebanon, specifically the hospital, uh, the public hospital in Beirut, has proven to be, uh, to, to be able to take leadership when it comes to public health. Okay. Uh, and this is something we should really focus on in order to save 
the country, we really need to believe in the public sector because only right. the public Do sector can act as a source of justice. If I may, and last Jamil, idea, that, privatization, Jamil. we've seen commercial banks Jamil. and we've seen where they, they have taken the country. Okay, that will be the last word. I, I think Patrick disagrees on what public or private, but this is still a worthy discussion and we will continue it. Gentlemen. Thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, for joining us. Patrick Mardini, Ibrahim and Nimna, and Jamil Mouad. And thank you all for watching. You can see the program again anytime. Go to our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team here. Bye for now.